Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us for this uh, last session of the day. I'm Will, and today Eric and I are going to tell you about our experiences taking some of the code we've developed that uses Spark and making it consumable and reusable by people who aren't us. Uh, we're going to be talking about two libraries today, uh, the Silex and ISARN libraries. These are uh, open source libraries that are mostly factored from internal applications we've developed at Red Hat, but we've also used them as sandboxes for new ideas, things we wouldn't want to submit as a PR to Spark, maybe because they're half-baked or so on. We've been maintaining uh, libraries that use or interact with Spark for over three years now, and we've made a, a lot of mistakes along the way. So the main goal of this talk is to ensure that you don't make at least some of the same mistakes. Now, Eric and I were both experienced library developers in other environments when we started extending Spark and publishing it as libraries. So we'll cover some of the Spark-specific things that you run into while extending Spark with your own libraries. But you might be an experienced Spark developer who's new to publishing libraries. So we'll try and cover some more general issues as well with an eye towards working in the Spark ecosystem. So we're really excited to have the opportunity to give a deep dive talk. We've been excited about these since there was first a deep dive track at Spark Summit. Uh, this is a half hour session though and we're the only thing standing between you and the reception. So we're gonna go deep on a few topics and limit our breadth, but we'll call out places where you can go to learn more after the session is over. So with that out of the way, let's get started. We'll start by talking about some basic philosophical considerations for writing reusable Spark code. We'll talk about how to extend Spark's parallel collections with generic functions, how to extend data frames with user-defined aggregate functions, how to expose functionality we've developed in Scala for the JVM to Python users for PySpark, and we'll talk about publishing our work so that other people can use it. The most important philosophical point to keep in mind as a library developer is that you can't control how your code is gonna be used. You might have a great solution to correct someone's imperfect vision, and you might imagine one way to use it. But once you release it out into the wild, it's out of your control. It might turn out that people are using your eyeglasses, not just to wear on their heads and correct their vision, but also to focus the rays of the sun and start small fires. Similarly, when you're writing an internal function in your own program, you know how it's gonna be used. Is the data frame I'm operating on cached or not? How many columns does it have? What are their names and types? Am I gonna be running this with many partitions or few? What kind of executors am I gonna be running it on? But when you write a library, all of that goes out the window. Anyone can use your code however they want, and probably in a way that you didn't expect them to. Another concern is doing things the right way. There are a lot of ad hoc solutions that can make a ton of sense in an app. It's okay to duct tape two things together to make them work. When we're developing a library that we want other people to use though, these ad hoc solutions won't do. We need to go the extra mile to use supported interfaces and play by the rules. This can mean a little more work for us as developers, but it'll make life a lot easier for our users. So a lot of the problems you'll run into as a library developer will fall into one of two categories. Challenges caused by users not using your code in ways you anticipated, and challenges related to doing things the right way instead of relying on an ad hoc solution. And everything we'll talk about today is gonna to reflect one or both of these themes. Starting with the first thing we'll talk about, which is not being able to predict the environment people will wanna use our code in. If you're developing a Scala library, code built with one version of Scala isn't compatible with code built with another version. So you wanna use SBT's cross-building facility so that you can build a library for multiple Scala versions. And this actually turns out to be very easy. You can just add the Scala versions you wanna support as a cross Scala version setting in your build definition. And then if you're gonna run any SBT task, you can prepend that with a plus in order to execute it for every Scala version. This means that you can compile, test, or even publish your code for multiple Scala versions in a single command. And there's even a way to specify a particular version if you just wanna run a test for one version. So this is just sort of a warm up way to think about how our library dependencies can turn into something that people using our code in ways we haven't anticipated. But another aspect of not knowing how your users will deploy your code is the Spark version. You may compile against an Apache binary of Spark, but your users may wanna build an application against Spark from another distribution, a Spark that they've compiled locally with patches, or even just a more recent patch release than the one you built your library against. By using the provided dependency scope for your Spark dependency, you can compile against one version, but let your users bring their own for their own applications. Another consideration is how your code is gonna be called. And this winds up being a problem for how you use resources. Imagine you have some code for batch model training that works really well when you run it once to train a single model. But perhaps your users are gonna to wanna to run it many times in a loop 
and it's gonna crash because you leak a resource. Similarly, code that works well for small data sets may not work well for large data sets if you aren't careful. Let's see a couple of examples of how this plays out for Spark libraries. Let's say you're writing a function to operate on an RDD or data frame, and you need to ensure that it's cached before you operate on it. So caching indiscriminately like this, just at the entry to this function, is one of these things we can get away with in an application sometimes, but not in a library. If a client calls this code many times, they'll wind up running out of memory because they'll be wasting a lot of cache. So we'll wanna actually unpersist that RDD when we're done with it. Now the problem here is that if we're actually dealing with an arbitrary user supplied collection, we don't know if the user wanted it to be cached or not. This code will wind up working fine for RDDs that were not cached when the user called the function, but it will surprise a user who passed in a cached RDD by unpersisting it. A better approach is to not make any assumptions. By checking the storage level of the RDD, we can see if we need to cache it so that we only cache collections that the user hasn't already cached. Since we now know whether or not we needed to cache the collection at the entry to the function, we can also clean up behind ourselves, but only if necessary, uncaching the collection only if the user hadn't cached it. Another resource that we'll wanna be careful with is broadcast variables. You may just be able to indiscriminately create broadcast variables in an application, but if you're publishing a function that someone may be able to call more times than you expect them to, you wanna be sure to clean up after yourself and unpersist those broadcast variables when you're done with them. Another important aspect of developing libraries that people can use in ways you don't anticipate is ensuring you've provided sufficiently generic abstractions. You want people to be able to use your library on the widest range of data structures possible. So the first of Spark's partition collections is the Resilient Distributed Dataset, which poses an interesting challenge for developing generic code. I think I've now reached my turnstile limit for this slide deck, but basically all this means is that if you have a type T that's a subtype of type U, an RDD of T is not a subtype of an RDD of U. We'll look at a concrete example of this. We have a type which we've implemented as a Scala trait called has user ID for things that have a user ID and we have a transaction class that extends that type. So we might wanna write a function that operates on an RDD of anything that's a subtype of has user ID, but we can't do it this way. In fact, if we pass an RDD of transactions to this bad key by user ID function, it won't compile because the RDD is invariant. So there's a good way to work around this problem involving Scala's generic types and implicit resolution. And if you photograph that QR code, your phone will take you to a blog post that explains it but we won't have time to talk about that solution in this session because we'd like to turn our focus to writing generic functions that operate on data frames. The example we'll talk about is natural join, where you wanna join two data frames on all the columns that they have in common and return a data frame with the union of those columns. So in this case, we're gonna do the join and then our output is gonna have all of the columns that these two data frames had in common. So we can write an ad hoc query to do this for collections that we know their structure, like this, where we're just constructing a compound expression where we say if, if the A column in DF1 equals the A column in DF2, and so on, for the, all the columns that these two data frames have in common, we'll get those results, and then we could just project out the columns that we care about with a select. But if we wanna do this in a generic way, we'll have to introspect over the structure of the data frame. So we'll start, by actually looking at the column names that we have. So we can get the columns in the left frame, the columns in the right frame, and the columns that those two data frames have in common. The next thing we'll do is dynamically constructing expressions. Here we're constructing a list of equality expressions for all the columns that these two frames have in common. We're then gonna combine those expressions together in a single expression by taking the conjunction of every expression in that list. So we can visualize what this looks like by saying we have a list of expre equality expressions for every column, for arbitrary columns that these two data frames have in common, and that reduce there is just gonna turn this into a conjunction of all of those things. When we wanna make sure that we only have one copy of each column in the result, we'll do this by just constructing a list of column names and we're gonna do this by taking the columns that are in the left data frame but not in the right, the left data frame and the, the right, the ones that are in the left but not the right, and then the ones that are in the right but not the left. And we're gonna use this uh, operator in Scala to turn a list into an argument list so that we can apply it to a select. <laughs> 
Of course, we aren't always writing functions that operate on entire data frames. Actually, usually we aren't writing functions that operate on entire data frames. Usually we're extending data frames and writing functions and queries. So let's also talk about user-defined functions. And the example I want to use for user-defined functions is just declaring a user-defined function that takes a data frame of JSON data and returns structures. So we're going to deserialize JSON objects, and we're going to take some of the fields and turn those into structures that we can query in the data frame. And that's what this, this, what this will, uh, what that will look like is on this slide. Uh, we have just our imports at the beginning, and we're going to have a function called selectively structure that's going to take a list of fields that we want to take out of the JSON objects. And first, we're going to declare the type. We're going to have a, a structure consisting of a bunch of strings for every field that we passed in as an interesting field. And then we're going to have the actual implementation of the user-defined function. And all we're doing here is we're deserializing a JSON object, and we're turning a list of all of the fields that we cared about from that JSON object. Uh, we have to program defensively because we don't know what kind of data we're going to receive. So if we fail, we're just going to return an empty structure. And finally, we're just going to register that as a user-defined function with the implementation and the return type in Spark. We can then use this function in our queries. And what we have here is a function that returns a user-defined function. So it's sort of generally useful no matter what field someone cares about. And here we're going to declare a user-defined function that extracts the BNX fields. And we're going to use that in a query where we, we just uh, sort of add a structure to the end of a data frame. Spark's machine learning pipelines provide another way to write generic functions against data frames. And there are three key interfaces in the machine learning pipelines library. Transformers take data frames as input and produce data frames as output. Estimators take data frames as input and produce transformers as output. And finally, parameters configure the execution of estimators and transformers, setting metadata like input and output columns, providing model hyperparameters, and more. We won't have time to go into detail about machine learning pipelines in this session, but I gave another talk a few hours ago about implementing machine learning algorithms for Spark that covers machine learning pipelines, and I'd encourage you to watch the video. Uh, now I'm going to turn it over to Eric. He'll show us how to implement user-defined aggregate functions, how to extend PySpark with code to be implemented in Scala, and some considerations for publishing our work. Thanks, Will. So user-defined aggregate functions, or UDAFs, are one of Spark's most powerful tools for adding custom features that integrate fully with all of Spark's native, native data frame capabilities. Um, they are the correct approach to add new ways for rolling up Spark's columnar data. For example, summarizing text columns with custom logic or sketching numeric columns with an estimated distribution. There's three components to a user-defined aggregate implementation. Defining the logic of the aggregation itself, um, declaring user-defined types that uh, describe the schemas of your working internal type and the type presented to your users. And uh, lastly, um, declaring all of the uh, logic for serializing um, from your live structures into the uh, row schema and back again. I'm going to start with uh, implementing aggregation logic since that defines the actual data frame operation the user hopes to accomplish. Uh, any custom aggregator we define has to be a subclass of the user-defined aggregate function. Um, this trait defines all the methods we have to fill in to play by the rules in uh, the data frame world. This aggregator can operate on any kind of numeric column, and so it takes a type parameter and that allows the user to tell it what kind of uh, numeric type to expect. Uh, my aggregator takes a couple parameters that allow the user to specify some details about how it operates. Um, many aggregators will always operate in the same way, and they would simply require no parameters. Uh, my aggregator may give slightly different results if I was to run it twice on the same data. So this method tells Spark it can't assume a previous result could be reused. My aggregator expects a single column as input. Um, that field name x has to be provided to the struct field, but uh, its value isn't actually important. Uh, the row type 
that holds my aggregator as it evolves has a single field. This field uses a special user-defined type, or UDT, uh, for my custom data structure. Uh, I'll talk more about that type shortly. The data type used to encode the partial results across the data frame partition is exactly the same as uh, my working buffer field type. Initialize, oopsie. <clears throat> Initialize creates um, an empty aggregation buffer. Um, my aggregator expects its working row type to be a mutable aggregation buffer. And I initialize the working buffer with an empty version of my internal aggregating structure. When the aggregation operation is finally complete, I actually have to specify the form of the result that's going to be returned as visible to the user. Evaluate expects a row type as its parameter instead of the immutable aggregation buffer type. You can see that the data type returned to the user is different than the user defined type declared internally for the aggregator logic. I'll talk more about this type as well. <clears throat> the update method receives a single row of input and updates the state of my aggregator to reflect that one item. You can see that the type of the input row and the working buffer are different. In my case, I'm content to skip any null input rows. Now, here's a good example of defensive programming to handle situations where your users may not apply your library with all the care that you would use for yourself. Um, like many aggregation data structures, my internal sketching structure has its own update method, and that's the true update logic. An update is a mutating operation on the working buffer, so the previous state is overwritten with the updated state. The merge combines two aggregation buffers from different data frame partitions, and it writes the merged result back into the first buffer. As with update, my aggregation data structure has its own merge method, which does all the merging work for me. The user-defined types, or UDTs, are companion structures that tell the data frame how to store your aggregation working data and how to present the final aggregation results back to the user. And the first thing I want to call out is that uh, certain Spark types don't have uh, external visibility, and uh, because of that, you're going to have to declare your UDTs under the org.apache.spark namespace. Now, this is slightly hackish, but also harmless. The SQL user-defined type is the type that is visible to the user as a result. You can see that this type is defined in terms of its companion UDT. The UDT is the type used internally by the data frame aggregation logic. This type co-refers back to the user visible type. My user visible type is primarily a shell for holding the aggregation data structure to present to the user. So in the internal UDT is where most of the action actually is. The UDT knows about a parallel type over in the Python universe. Uh, I'll discuss this more later. Next, I tell the data frame how to display the column type of this aggregation result in case that needs to be displayed. The SQL type method tells Spark about the working row schema that scores my custom aggregation data structure. Spark also needs to know how to store my working structure in a data frame row. The serialized method is what encodes this logic. Serialize returns another subtype of row and creates yet another kind of subtype internally. Now for efficiency, Spark stores deep data structures in a flattened form, and furthermore, it stores the flattened array data as a raw, unsafe memory. This is an excellent example of doing things the correct Spark way so that you can play in Spark's world. Here, you can see what it looks like in the code to store Scala arrays as a raw memory. You must also define the inverse operation, 
unpacking a you know, working row into a live structure in memory. Here we see an example of unpacking that raw memory back into safe scale arrays. And since I stored my structure in a flattened form, I have to like reinflate it to its full glory as part of the deserialization process. So we just saw how plain by Spark's rules allows us to implement a powerful custom aggregator that users can seamlessly combine with all of Spark's native, op native operations. But what if we want to expose our aggregator to PySpark users? Next, I'm going to talk about the proper procedures for giving your PySpark users access to the aggregator you've written in Scala. I'll begin by describing the mechanics of talking to the uh, Spark running on the JVM from a Python interpreter. Then I'll explain how to write user-defined types over in the Python universe. And finally, I'll describe how to build a bridge from Scala's strong typing system to Python's uh, typeless or duct-typed system. So I'll begin by importing PySpark's active Spark context. And from this, we can access a pi for j gateway to the running Spark JVM which is stored in the underscore JVM field. Now, once I have this gateway, I can refer to objects over in the JVM universe by their fully qualified Scala paths. Back over on the Scala side, I write some thin wrapper functions, and this will make me eas easier for me in Python. Here's a method that returns an aggregator expecting double values in a column. And you can see how this method hides the scale of type parameter. And this is important because the pi for j gateway doesn't really cope with type parameters. So back over in my Python library, I've written a companion function that has the same name. They use the JVM gateway to get a callable object that invokes the apply method on a UDAF that was returned by my scale function. And I call that with a somewhat magical looking incantation. And it creates a data frame column from the aggregator object combined with a column object coming in from the PySpark user. Now, Python wants its own parallel definitions of UDTs. And we'll see that these types are unsurprisingly very similar to their Scala counterparts. They also define the schema of a working aggregation row in Pythonic syntax. They can name their own Python module. They know the name of their uh, Scala counterpart UDT. And they know how to provide their own data type name to the data frame. Um, serialization works like it does in Scala. However, uh, Python's duct typing makes this code a lot more compact than on the Scala side. And deserialize is uh, likewise the same. Now recall that a scale of UDT can supply the name of a PySpark counterpart. So here's where PyUDT method I mentioned a few minutes ago becomes mandatory for you to define. So now I'm going to show you how to take advantage of a very clever trick that Spark knows. Spark can find compiled Python files in a Maven jar file and load both the Python and the Scala class files into the right places. This allows your users to apply your library in either Spark or PySpark from a single Maven file. In the SBT build system, I add some custom file mapping for compilation and packaging. Then I map the .pyc files from my repo into a corresponding jar path. At each level of this path, I have to have the underscore underscore init.pyc files, uh, even though, in my case, they're almost always empty. And of course, my actual source files appear in uh, their leaf directories. Lastly, I actually have to teach SBT how to compile Python. So I create a custom task for compiling Python files. And I fill that in with the actual commands for invoking a Python compiler. So with this trick, my users can supply a single dash dash packages argument and use my library in either Spark or PySpark. <laughs> 
here I'm going to pause to point out. Um, as you can see, I have uh, published my libraries so that the Spark version here, 2.2, uh, which just proves that I've gotten behind on my uh, sustaining engineering, um, is part of the version. And likewise, the version of Python that was used to compile my .pyc files is included. So in theory, you can also download exactly the same library, just dash p, py 3.5s to get the version of a package that was compiled using uh, you know, Python 3. So you're going to need to publish your library somewhere, and it's best to make it easy for your users. Two very popular options for publishing Maven artifacts are Bintray uh, and, of course, Maven Central. And sadly, I don't have time to explain the subtle differences. Um, suffice to say that Bintray is going to be easier for you as a developer to get working, um, but it makes it just slightly harder um, on your users. Uh, conversely, Maven Central is uh, going to be more work for you to get set up, but once you do, it'll make life uh, basically as easy as possible for anybody wanting to use your library. So we started by introducing two principles. People will use things in ways you don't expect, and you'll need to do things the right way. We talked about writing generic functions for parallel collections. We covered the details implementing user-defined aggregates. We showed you how to expose functionality developed for Scala, like the user-defined aggregate API, to PySpark users. So we hope we will let us know what libraries you develop. Um, here's how you can get in touch with us. The RAD Analytics IO is a community for intelligent applications, and it's where our Silex library lives. So please check that out, too. Um, we even have stickers for the first few people to say hello after the talk. Um, thanks a lot for your time. All right. So one comment I have, not a uh, question. Quick is that the Python stuff, mm -hmm. you don't necessarily have to compile. If you just put the .py files in, it also works. Will it really? Yeah. Oh. And like compiling actually makes it worse in the sense that you have to compile for both 2.7 and 3.5. Okay. That's great. Yeah. So um, just wanted to give that point. Any questions? Or just offline? Okay. Cool. Um, right. Thank you.